But yeah, yeah, what I really want to do is, you know, we get a lot of questions in the clinics about, about, you know, current treatments, about clinical trials. And so what I really wanted to do today was just provide an overview uh, of, and, and, you know, it's informed by some of the questions that people ask us in, in the clinic, really. Um, yeah, so what we're going to be doing really is talking about really, you know, and focusing very much about the options, um, you know, if the cancer, if the um, glioblastoma comes back and starts to grow, talking about what we could offer standardly, and then after that, what trial options might be available for people. So very briefly, I mean, uh, brain tumors, I think, are an important group of tumors. Uh, they're not necessarily the commonest tumors, but the impact that they have on people uh, because of the age, because of the what it does to people's life, which we're going to talk about later, I, I think it, it's something that has a very, very big impact on people. And what I'm basically going to be talking about today really is going to be glioblastoma, partly because it's the most common form of uh, brain tumors that we see. It's not the only one. There are lots of different brain tumors. What we do for them is, is very, very different. But the one that most people, that we, that we have most contact with, that most people uh, come into contact with is glioblastoma. And unfortunately, it's also one of the most aggressive ones. And so that's going to be where I'm going to be focusing uh, my uh, talk, but happy to talk about others in, in question time. Uh, yeah, it's over half of what we deal with, really. And one thing I have to say is that um, chemotherapy, is, is one option and uh, for people whose cancers come back or are starting to grow. And I think that although it does get a bad press, it actually is a very, very valid option. Uh, we rarely, rarely give more radiotherapy when the tumor starts to grow again. It's not impossible. And surgery is also a possibility. But pretty much if uh, now everyone's going to have to have a discussion about what, what chemotherapy means for them. And, uh, I think one of the reasons why perhaps chemotherapy is people have a bit nihilistic about it is that if you just look at the statistics, you know, and statistics are great if you're a researcher, but if for each person that I talk to is not so useful, we totally accept that chemotherapy, if we, the chemotherapies that we give will help some people and not everybody. And if you look at what any given individual, you know, if we look at the group of people, chemotherapy will shrink the tumor in about five or ten percent of cases, right? That's shrinkage. But as a larger group of people, that it will stop the, the cancer from growing, stop the GBM from growing. And really, that is as worthy in terms of keeping people well and having good quality as actually shrinking the tumor. So really, almost about probably about a third of people or so will benefit. And the chemotherapies that we give are actually very well tolerated. So, you know, that's an important thing to be said. If you try it, you're probably not going to feel particularly unwell. And if it works for you, that can go on for, for a, a long period of time. So I think it's still a valid option. Uh, we're not saying that it's the answer. But it's, I, I think that it's, it, it was probably going a little bit too far to say that chemotherapy was perhaps not so useful. So I think in terms of what we do at the Austin, we still routinely offer it and we still can see good results with that. So that's still a standard of care in, in my mind. However, increasingly, we should say that one thing about chemotherapy is that it's a little bit non-specific. It's not necessarily a cancer-specific treatment. It's really killing off anything that's rapidly growing. And it just happens that cancer is probably the most rapidly growing thing, one of the most rapidly growing tissues in your body. But the, the sea change now with all of the research that's going on is that we want to be much more focused. We want to hit just the cancer, or, or preferably mainly hit the cancer, and as a result of that give you good tumor control, but not too many side effects. And how we do this is that we understand, broadly speaking, what makes a cancer a cancer. And that's one of the, this, this is where this slide might be useful in that there are things that all cancers seem to need to be cancers. And one of the main things if in the bottom left corner there in red is what we call sustained angiogenesis, which is a, just a very, very fancy way of saying it needs a blood supply. Because the, the blood supply is what you know, brings the oxygen, what brings the nutrients that the cancer needs. So for a cancer to grow, it needs to establish a blood supply, which is actually quite a complicated process. But it's something that we think all cancers need to do. And specifically for glioblastoma, if we look at it, we know that glioblastoma is actually a very, very bloody cancer in that it has lots and lots of blood vessels. So, I don't know, and, ooh, 
that did not quite work the way I expected. And now I've killed it. So, um, right, let's. Alright. Okay, let's try this. Okay, good. Here we go. Uh, so, these things here, uh, I really should have checked it before I started my talk what the buttons do. Um, but I don't know if you can see these things here, which are obviously very red and look a little tubular. Glioblastomas have a lot of blood vessels. And uh, what happens is that here, you know, we imagine that this is the glioblastoma, this is your normal blood vessels. They'll actually try and attract new blood vessels through them by secreting pro-angiogenic um, um, factors. So things that the body usually uses to and it will attract the, the, the uh, blood vessels to them. Because if you can't get blood vessels, they're like the, the arterials into a city, right? If you can't get stuff in, the cancer actually cannot grow more than maybe half a centimetre of a centimetre. So it's vital for them to develop blood vessels. So, you know, understandably what happened then is that when we were starting to think about what we can do aside from chemo to try and attack um, very vascular cancers like um, glioblastoma, the first thought was well, let's prune the blood supply. Let's deprive it of oxygen and, and nutrients. And so probably what I'd say that it's probably accepted at this time, another approach to trying to treat these cancers is to try and target the blood supply. And many of you would probably have heard of a cancer, uh, a drug called uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab, for example. Uh, and uh, some of you may even have received it before. Um, and in, that, in this middle section of what I'm talking about, I think is where that's chemo here I'm talking about. Then this is anti-blood vessel therapies, of which the Bevacizumab is what we're talking about. And I think that this definitely have their place. Uh, these are basically drugs that will go in, try and interrupt the, uh, the, the cancer's blood supply. Um, and the, they're usually pretty well tolerated. They're not completely side effect free, but they are well tolerated generally. And that's because the rest of your body, when you are growing up, they've established their blood supply. They've got nice, mature, healthy blood supply that doesn't require growth factors. But the cancer is not so healthy, it's not so organized, it's, it, it requires these ongoing factors to support its blood supply. And if we can interrupt that, we can then hopefully limit the growth of the, the glioblastoma or the cancer. Uh, it's never that simple, obviously, but there are people who definitely uh, benefit from uh, using anti-blood vessel therapies like this. Why have they not taken off as much as perhaps you might think, what, why are they harder to access now? Why are they not funded? Well, par partly it's because that uh, some of the data that's there, uh, you know, it, it, we don't know necessarily how to select people yet for these treatments. Uh, and there wasn't really, you know, when, when what we want to show is that the drug will actually improve survival for people. That, you know, if you give the drug, at least some people are going to live longer. And unfortunately, <coughs> for complicated reasons, uh, that is not, that was not available. Uh, and perhaps with that situation is starting to change. Some of the st uh, studies are, are starting to be uh, undertaken now. And I think that it's possible that in some groups of people that Avastin or, or similar drugs may uh, be actually prolonging survival. But we don't know. But I think it's fair to say that many people access this, and although they have to pay for it, and that and we talk about, we often talk a bit about how to sequence it. And I can talk about that, but, you know, at another point. But I think that anti-blood vessel treatments are probably an established, currently accepted treatment, possibly more so in the U.S. than here. But it, it's widely used and widely accepted. And so that's where we kind of leave um, what is standard, what I think we're all happy, what's relatively readily available, and we're going to go a little bit more into what's more experimental at this time. And I'm going to talk about what I think is, uh, to some extent, what is currently being actively researched in a structured way and what is perhaps not being investigated in a systematic way. And I'm going to cherry pick a little bit. I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the things that I know best, but trying to give you a flavor more about what are the, the approaches that people are taking out there rather than every single you know, trial that's here or overseas. And coming back to this, this concept of saying that we're not now trying to be more selective or more targeted in how we, um, we treat cancers. And again, we're focusing on attacking the things that make cancers cancers, the things that are not so relevant to normal cells, 
because always what we're doing is trying to develop treatments which are going to mainly affect the cancer but not affect you as the person, not give you lots and lots of side effects. And we're not always successful but I think increasingly we are, um, we are able to be more selective. Um, so one of the things that we, we can do is that there's been a lot of amazing research using and you know, requ requiring lots of money, lots of participation, lots of people and we're starting to understand the wiring of cancers what actually, what is the circuitry that makes a cancer a cancer, right? And in, particularly we're looking at what, what, where, where are the vulnerable points? Where is it that a cancer is vulnerable but not a normal cell, okay? And the main point about this is that we, we can, we, the, the, we, we, this is a, um, like I guess a circuit pattern, and we can say that we know that in cancers, for example, uh, the, the things in red are areas where cancers have lots of it, perhaps more than normal cells, and the things in blue are where they have less of it, so they have less of the good things, perhaps more of the bad things, and a lot of the approach is can we switch off the aggressive things that make a cancer a cancer. And one of them is just a protein called EGFR. Don't, not too stressed about that, but you know, why, why do we target it? So this is an example of um, why these proteins make a cancer a cancer. So here we have on top of the cell surface, you have the EGFR protein. Right? And what happens is that the cancers basically take over this. They are in, when the EGFR is used in, say, a baby or something appropriately, it's incredibly helpful because what happens is that it, it helps the, the, the cells in, you know, to grow, it helps them to bring in the blood supply, it helps them to move around. And in, when this is properly controlled, this is absolutely essential to health and growth. But what cancers do, is that they take it over and they subvert it. So rather than having in a controlled way, they just take it over and they're constantly using it. It, it jammed in the on position and therefore this allows them to become a cancer. Right? So what we then do is that we develop drugs that actually will block that. Remembering that the cancers are very dependent on it, the normal cells are not. And you can do this in, in, in different ways. So you can have drugs that bind to the outside of, of the cell, you can have drugs that come to the inside. And if you switch it off, you turn off all the little processes in the cells, and as a result, you stop the cell's cancer from being able to grow and to live and to bring in its blood supply, for example. But it's a groovy concept. You know, sounds, makes sounds very logical. Not so easy in real life. And um, so in the early days, I talked about how in about more than 50% of cases, we know that the EGFR protein is very, very active. When we use the standard drugs that work against that in, say, lung cancer, when we put it into brain tumors, not so successful. And, you know, why is that? That's People spend their whole careers trying to figure this sort of stuff out a bit. You know, there's that sort of research that is hopefully one they're going to allow us to actually pick the people that's going to benefit from it. Um, but although any given target may not pan out, the overall approach is right. This is, what is going to, this is what is going to help us to beat glioblastoma in the future, understanding what drives it and then selectively targeting it. And I'm going to talk about some of the studies that we have actually right here in, in Victoria, in Melbourne, uh, and stuff that's going on all around the world uh, to try and beat the glioblastoma. No, it's okay. I just oh. need to do that. Oh, okay. Um, so, Coming back to that, I was going to say, so if you look again at the circuit uh, diagram that we've developed from uh, lots of research, I, I was going to say, you know, EGFR looks very promising. There's something called PR3 kinase that's very interesting. Uh, one, something that's interesting but rare is FGFR. And these are all things that are currently in clinical trials at the moment. And it's all based upon understanding the biology, the circuitry of what, what say, makes something a glioblastoma. Okay. This is a fairly current list about the clinical trials that are in, uh, in Victoria. Uh, you, you can't read it, you know, but just to say that the, the, those studies are based upon the circuitry. And to also acknowledge that you know, Australia and, and Victoria, all, you know, we're not the world's largest country in terms of population, but really in brain tumor research, we are definitely holding our own. You know, I think that, uh, that, that the options for trials uh, if you give, take our population into account and all, it's actually very, uh, it's, it, it, it's, um, what's the word we call? I think it shows that what, 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 that we're doing good work here in Australia, basically. 
Um, but I'm going to cherry pick a few studies just to illustrate what I'm saying, and some of which, be, which because I've been personally involved in. And the, the first one I want to talk about is back to this EGFR protein. And that's what I was saying about wanting to be more selective. Right? Now, EGFR does have some problems because EGFR is part of normal cells. But we did know that, in fact, there was a, a, a basically a variant of EGFR, um, a particularly nasty variant of EGFR, that was only on cancer cells. Absolutely only on cancer cells. Found nowhere else in the body. So for us, and this was something that was really developed in Australia, we said, well, that surely has to be an amazing target. Because if we can knock that out, we can pretty much guarantee that you know, you're not going to have any side effects. Right? So, what that, that you know, there was a, an effort that took 15 to 20 years. It was something that was mainly driven by the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, which is now the Olivia Newton, Olivia Newton John Cancer Research Institute, and it was something that was really undertaken here in Melbourne. And so, an antibody was generated to, against that tumor-specific uh, cancer protein called EGFRV3, which we knew made the cancer would make the glioblastomas particularly um, aggressive. All of this slide is saying is that we generated this antibody. The antibody was entirely tumor specific. It didn't bind to any normal tissues, which is the point of uh, this particular bit here. And that in fact, when we, when we treated with mice, even in, in glioblastoma, it was working well in mice. Okay. So I think at that, but, you know, this took about 10 years of work and research and dedication to, to do. But then we figured, well, why stop there, really? Why not go for the double whammy? So we know that the antibody itself comes in and binds to the cancer cell and will in, in, you know, switch off some of that protein and kill some of the cancer cells. But because this was absolutely tumor specific, we could be very confident that it wasn't going to go into most parts of the body. We said, why don't we also stick on a, a, a powerful chemotherapy on the end of it? Now, the, the drug that was chosen, I think, comes from a, a shellfish or something. It, it's absolutely, um, you know, it, it's really strong. We can't give it to people directly. If we do, they become extremely unwell. So it's so potent, it cannot be used as an injection or anything like that. But if we give small amounts and stick it back onto the back of this antibody, the antibody will deliver it straight to the cancer and the cancer only, because that's the only place that the antibody goes. So I guess to conceptualize it, I, when I try to explain, you know, it's the guided missile, it's the heat-seeking heat missile. So what this will do is that if that barbecue is the brain tumor, and it was the only guided missile image I could find, so, <laughs> you know, it's not the best analogy, but, um, so the theory is that that heat-seeking missile should only hit the barbecue and the chap standing next to it, the good guy, should be okay because he's not, you know, as hot, so to speak. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just trying to illustrate the concept. Really. Um, but this is a study that's now been going on probably a couple of years, and at, at the time it was uh, it was only in five or six centers around the world, and it was only in, in at the Austin in, in Melbourne. And what we're showing here is this graph that my colleague Angie Lessman. This is the most up-to-date data, so we presented it. And what we, want to, what we want to show here is that each bar is a patient, is a person that we put onto this particular study. It's a very early study, so it's not, you know, it's only about a, a dozen or so patients. And any bar that is going downwards, right, is someone whose tumor has shrunk, all right? Any bar that is going upwards, despite the treatment, the cancer grew, okay? And what you can see here is that for this person, their tumor shrank all the way, it, all of it, 100% disappeared, which is another way of saying it completely and utterly vanished. We got rid of it all together. Uh, and, and, and then we, you know, we did it for, for these people as well. It didn't work in these people. And we're trying to figure out why that is the case. And, uh, Overall, the response rate or the ability to shrink the tumor was about a third of people. Now, that is actually a pretty amazing number in, in brain tumor research. That is pretty amazing. And it wasn't just a flash in the pan. Oh, well, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with MRI scans. One of those people, this was the tumor. Great, big, irregular, sub-nasty looking thing. 
gone. Okay. Now, like every of these things, you know, there's a bit of salesmanship. I put up the best case to make a point, obviously. But I think it's fair to say that at multiple centers around the world, we have seen this particular drug uh, show in very interesting early activity. Now, we, I don't want to oversell it. It's definitely early. It, but however, it was sufficiently interesting for things interesting for two things to happen. The, U, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the European EMA um, have given it what we call orphan drug status, which is a way they're saying they think it's so promising that they want to help develop it faster. So that's a recognition, a, a very important recognition. And the other thing is that FV, who is the company, I, I think this is so promising they are accelerating that. And this is now spread to hundreds, well maybe not hundreds, but lots and lots of cancer centers around Australia and the world. And this is going to progress from what we call very early studies in phase one to phase two and phase three studies. And those are the studies that are meant to change practice. Okay. So um, the other thing that will follow is just about how long did it work, because sometimes work, drugs work for a while, not others. And you can see that the, the person that's uh, ongoing is up to about 500 odd days. Uh, or someone that we know. So, yeah. so that's one approach, right? To say that you, you know, by tar doing these sort of targeted therapies, you can really get some very interesting. <coughs> so I think that those are what we call antibody drug conjugates are certainly a very interesting way forward. Another thing that's very, very topical at the moment that I think maybe will change things is uh, immunotherapy. And briefly to conceptualize it. Uh, this is meant to show Harry Potter and his cloak of invisibility. Uh, it's actually quite hard to find a picture of an invisible cloak. Uh, so <laughs> this, this was the best that I could do. Um, but on a serious note, cancers basically work this way. They, they, they have their own cloak of invisibility, which has been very, very hard to penetrate. So essentially what happens is that um, they basically surround themselves with little proteins, which it doesn't matter what they're called. They, they put these proteins on, and when your immune system comes, ordinarily, if they didn't have these proteins, the immune system would say, well, you are clearly abnormal, kill it. Nobody would ever have cancer, basically. However, they secrete these proteins, they have their own little cloak, and they are invisible to the immune system. It's been one of the biggest problems that we have. And, and everyone, everyone has always said, if you can harness your own immune system to kill a cancer, that's the best thing. It's got no side effects. It will root out every single cancer cell, theoretically speaking, and kill it. But decades of research have essentially never been able to do this until probably the last five years. And like this has probably been, you may have heard some of the results with things like melanoma and lung cancer where these things have been absolutely amazing. And they're just starting now to trickle into, um, into brain tumors. I think in brain tumors, the studies are probably going about a year or, or less or thereabouts. I put up two drugs at ipilimumab and nivolumab. I, I don't think it's important except to say that this is something that's hot in all cancer and is now currently being tested in, in brain tumors as well. And just to come back to that, uh, we had a study here. Uh, no, where is it? Uh, anyway, we had a study looking at one of the drugs, nivolumab, in brain tumors. It, uh, I can tell you that a worldwide this drug, it, it, there was so much enthusiasm for it that this study recruited like something like several hundred patients in six to nine months. Un unheard of. They did so well, they said, what the hell, we'll just increase the numbers because that will give us better data. It, that study opened and shut in the blink of an eye, really. And we're just all waiting to see what is going to happen with that. Uh, we hope that there are going to be several, uh, you know, I think that there are going to be a f maybe hopefully two more of these studies opening. Um, and that would be great to give access to people who are wanting that. Really. Uh, so immunotherapy is definitely hot and something to watch this space. And then with, I'm not far off from the end. I, I think that the other question that often I get in my clinic is, you know, you've had all your treatment, you know, you're well, you want something else, where do you go? And you go to the internet and you, you know, you, you find all this stuff and it all sounds great. You know, it really all, but, but how do you pick all of, between all of this? And how do you make sense of some of it? Because it's often in very technical language. So all I want to give you is an idea of where I think there's some very interesting stuff going on. Um, and I'm just going to cover it quickly. But to continue the immunotherapy, uh, to, sorry, there are different ways of doing immunotherapy. I talked about perhaps taking away the 
invisible cloak, right? But um, vaccines are another way. That's where the body may not recognize the cancer cloak or not. And what you have to do is actually wake it up. So that is abnormal. You need to go and attack that. Um, conceptually easy, practically very difficult to do. And some of you have, you know, I have patients who ask me about these specific vaccines and I would say they are extremely interesting. There are studies going on. We are waiting to hear about them. But like all the things in trials, they are experimental. There are lots of other experimental immunotherapies that are out there which are all very interesting, but they all remain experimental. Uh, the, ca um, the cannabis oil, have, I had a few questions recently about that. I think that's even more experimental that, that you know, in the lab, it's all looking very interesting. Sorry? Closer to the Closer. Sorry. Okay. Yes. You're running away. I'm running away. Usually my voice carries, but yeah. So, look, um, well, no. uh, yeah, so that is very interesting in the lab. It's got to follow the, the normal progression where you actually then start to test it for safety and for efficacy. But, you know, I'm sure that will happen. And there's many, many other very interesting research things that people are doing, all right? So these are not ready for prime time, but, but one day they will be. Um, but if you are looking for something that, uh, you know, to help you now, just be aware, all of these things, even all the trials I've talked about, are experimental. Um, we have some data about things that these, again, I get asked a lot about these two. And I just put them up, not to, not to sort of dish them or anything like that, to say that right now, if you ask, is, is this something that's going to become mainstream? No, because the data as it stands at the moment does not suggest that there's a definite survival benefit. More research may find a group where it will benefit them, but they are basically, with the NOVA TTF, which I can talk about later, is very expensive, uh, very fiddly, very technically challenging, and I would say really not available in Australia. And so if you're thinking about whether you want to go and try this, if it's about a cancer that's, your cancer that's come back, it has not shown the survival benefit. With, this, with the gang cycle here, again, similar thing, although it's actually quite easy to do. It's, it's a, it's a well-tolerated drug. So this is where the, currently there is no proven benefit for the moment. Um, so just in conclusion, I just wanted to give you a, a flavor, if you could, and I hope that you could hear most of that since I was obviously stepping back and forth. Um, I want to tell you that standard therapies are worthwhile just because they don't help everybody does not mean they don't help some people and the people they help, they help, they can help for a, a very significant period of time, maintain quality of life, and they don't have a lot of side effects. But not, we definitely need more therapies without doubt. And I think we are, some of the things that are coming along are new ways of doing it. They're not chemotherapy. They are very, very exciting. But I wanted to say to you, I think that it's imperative, I don't, I don't think I'll find many dissenters in this group, that what, it's absolutely imperative that we support research and we support clinical trials. Okay. Clinical trials, in my opinion, are the places, are, are, are the, the most promising candidates that are unproven at the moment. And if you, at the other thing I say, and it's about altruism, Whatever happens in a clinical trial, if you directly benefit, that's great. If you don't, you can at least be assured that your participation has, is helping to progress research in, in brain tumors. So that's one thing, you know, that I think support clinical trials, and I think support research, because as the story I was telling you, um, the people who are in the labs who are trying to get grants to, to that create all these new studies, it's a long process, a bit invisible sometimes to the media, um, but they're, they're aware all of these new treatments come. So if you get a chance to advocate for research and for trials, please do so. So thank you.